Well, welcome back to Beer Brackets, everybody. Today, we have a very, very, very special interview that we're excited about. If you've seen any of our other interviews, then you might be wondering, why are we talking to Stefan? Well, we have a very good reason to talk to Stefan. We're welcoming him today from the French Cooking Academy YouTube channel. We'll put a link to that down below. Please go check it out if you haven't. He has amazing French cooking recipes that are extremely, extremely fun and easy to follow. I've watched a couple of his videos before starting this interview. They're great, so definitely go check that out. Stefan was willing to join us today to talk about all things food. We're going to learn about him, learn about his channel a little bit. Stefan, thank you so much for joining us. Before we get started, I know we've been waiting a little while. I think we should open, as we like to say, open our beer brackets and open a beer before we start our chat. Stefan, what are you drinking today? You mentioned you got a beer from a local craft brewery, right? Yes, that's right. So for you today, uh, this is a local brewery. It's called Noodle Doof. Uh, so, uh, you know, just recently, I mean, recently opened, kind of thing, a bit of a, more than a year ago. So having two beers enthusiasts got together, two friends, and uh, they, they craft different beer. But for me, because here it's summer, I brought, I don't know if you can see, it's called a oh. Session session Ale. Session. From what I've learned, is it the type of beer you can drink on a summer day? It's easy to have multiple glass, which is suited for that little time we have here because uh, it's kind of hot actually here. So I was like, yes, <laughs> good, good time for a good beer. So a 3.5% alcohol comes in these little glass jars, you know, well, I guess, you know, you call the growlers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's a good bottle. You can just do a refill. So for the environment, there's that thing as well, no cans, whatever. We use the glass. You go with your refill. And um, that's what I brought today. What cool. about you guys? Yeah, Alessandro, I'm curious. What are you drinking today? Well, uh, it's uh, winter here, uh, at least in Florida, it is today, and probably only today. It's about 10, 10 Celsius, like it was in the 50s, right? So I found this uh, this bottle of beer uh, that I had in the fridge that is more like, you know, perfect for a winter day, <laughs> San Bernardo's. Is the monk winking? He is not, my friend. Unfortunately, no, he so is not. Was, um, there's a legend to this beer, the St. Bernardus ABT-12, where every 1,000 bottles, the little monk, the Belgian monk that you see on the front there, he's winking. But we've right. never oh, had yeah. a bottle where he's winking. Yeah, I'm sure after a few of those bottles, when you drink it, you start to see a lot of wings. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, exactly. that's the thing. That's why they do it. So they confuse you. And I swear I've seen it What I said in one of our episodes, like you just, yeah, after a couple of them, you start seeing him winking at you. And I am drinking a Brit. It's winter here. We're talking about winter. It's minus 20 degrees Celsius. I got 10 feet of snow outside my house. I had to dig out the car yesterday. I don't know if you've ever had to dig your car out of a snowbank before leaving the house, but I had to do that. No. Yesterday. I and had so to. <laughs> we've been on the channel. We've been talking about British ales recently. We have a series uh, exploring different British ales. And one of them that we will be reviewing very soon is the old speckled hen. Um, so I have a couple of them around left over from the review. So guys, cheers. Stefan, again, merci beaucoup. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, uh, Dorian, I shall gladly open this one because uh, <laughs> it's getting hot in here. It's so how much alcohol is in your beer? Uh, the speckled hen is not that high. It's 5% alcohol. So these English bitters oh. are normally, you know, in the four to five range. This is what's called the premium bitter. So it's 4.8% and higher, which is about, this is kind of as high as English ales go. So when you said bitter, is it because there is an actual bitter taste to it? So that's interesting. Yeah. So English bitters, um, they're known. Have you ever heard of a pale ale? So there's some beers that you can see that just are labeled pale ales. That, and, that's kind of almost like a pale ale. It looks like a lager in terms of colors. You can see the color of this one. So yeah, you know what? that's pretty, nice it's pretty clear. It's a little deceiving, right? Because you think pale ale will be pale. It'll be lighter. But pale ales are actually usually a little darker. Oh, they're yours is interesting. Okay. Yeah, and so uh, they call them bitters in the UK because they use a certain kind of hops and uh, where the hops, it's a lot more hop forward, so it's a lot more bitter mm -hmm. in taste and finish. Um, so their ales tend to be of this style, a little bit more bitter. So they got the nickname bitter, which kind of stuck. Oh, this one is dark. <laughs> yeah, look at that, right? <laughs> Cheers. Well, Cheers, Cheers, guys. And, uh, Santé. I'm a bit, Santé. Don't, don't be fooled because I'm a bit red already, but that's because here it's, I go surfing all the time and it's, it's oh, really hot and I get sunburned already. So. Well, it's then it's time for a beer. Cheers. Yeah, exactly. Santé. We're all drinking Santé. for different Santé. reasons. Allez, allez, allez. You're drinking to cool off. I'm drinking to warm up. Alessandro's just drinking. So, yeah. I have to say that, you know, when it's, I'm like, I was, uh, you know, I was saying to some people, yeah, you know, I drink a lot of wine, of course, being French, but um, yeah, in the hottest, for me as a, you know, as a French person, a lot of people, uh, French people love beer. You know, I only drink beer, like when it's hot, that's really good. 
You know, on a hot day, yes. uh, it's, it's the best. It's, you can have a white wine or something, but it's really, yeah. really hot. When it's and really, really, really cold yeah. beer, it's like, oh, uh, you know, it's yeah. nice and refreshing. Exactly. And, uh, you know, you could say the same thing about a really, really cold day, I'm telling you, and you have a nice, either a darker beer or one like Alessandro has, warms yeah. you up, warms you up from the inside out, almost like drinking a whiskey, same kind of thing. It's uh, it's a little magic happening. It's uh, kind of like it's fresh, it's cold, but at the same time, it's it's suited for when it's cold, like it's uh, mm. outside. It, it's a. Uh, I have to say that every exactly, exactly. It's a wizardry. Stefan, yeah. I, I really, I, I want to. Well, we always start our interviews with the same question, so I'm going to get to that very, very, very soon. But I'm really curious about your channel because currently you have just about six hundred thousand subscribers. So I would assume this is and uh, watching your videos. Um, the quality of the videos is really high, and there's obviously a lot of thought put into it. So what we want to know to start off with, is this a full-time gig for you in the sense that do you have to dedicate all your time to this? Is this is your day-to-day -day activities preparing for this channel? And if so, the question that we always ask is, what is a day in the life like for you? So when you wake up in the morning, when you're prepping for your channel, when you're prepping to make these videos, what's a day like for you? What's your process? Mm. So as you, you know, as you mentioned, um, the channel has been around, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it was not always that big, obviously. Yeah. So it started, uh, I think now I was looking actually yesterday, I think about almost six years ago. Oh, wow. So, and it well, started as a, uh, really I think, I've, you know what, sometimes I think that I'm really one of those old fashioned YouTubers that were still following the motto of, of YouTube. It was it used to be called YouTube, like broadcast yourself. Yeah, exactly. And the motto of YouTube was before, because now it's all super polished, super quality. When I started, it was still like, okay, you get a camera, you film yourself. And what you had was like some people out there trying their thing. You think, oh, I mean, I want to share this. And uh, sorry, it's a bit of a helicopter for a second, right? But uh, we actually started, uh, I started with just an iPhone when I started at the beginning. That was all I yeah. had. And uh, it was not always the best quality of footage and stuff. So it took some time to get there. Yeah, And uh, at the beginning, I was doing this for fun. So I was working not in food at all. I was actually uh, working with computers and IT technician ah. when I started. So nothing to do with food. Well, and really I, I always love food because, uh, you know, being friends, like we're a bit spoiled and, and stuff like that. But, uh, but I started the channel on, on a fun idea to share things with people about French food and how to make things, uh, you know, the proper way and also sp spoken in English. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it took some, you know, it took some time to start. So it was taking some of my weekends to start with. Yep. And the more you go, basically, you know, the more video you start to upload, the more time it takes. And of course, now today it's a full time uh, endeavors, even though I'm posting every week. So, you know, I'm not, you know, on YouTube term, I'm not one of these uh, channel that posts two or three times. If you post two or three times, that's going to be not only full time, but it's going to be it's going to be your life. I mean, you're going to wake up, think about video, think about preparing and everything. And you need help at once that a week. Yeah, yeah. Once a week, it's, you have still space for organizing your topic, doing some research. So yes, it kinds of it is a full time job, but I've got some time to spare to do other things. So it is a full time uh, activity now because I'm doing this plus the other things that people don't know about, which is when you're a YouTuber or whatever you. You have all these other like social media related things, uh, the interaction with people, the comments, uh, you know, we've got Facebook, Instagram, or, or all the platforms that you have. Yeah. And I would say to anyone out there that this is, when you have a channel like this, is what actually takes most of your time is, is being there for everybody and responding. And so, you, so you, you prepare the video, that's one thing. You prepare to film, you search a recipe, but then you have other things on the side that kind of fill, fill your time. So yes, uh, a day in the life <laughs> of me today, uh, it's like, yeah, you do wake up and it's imagine, okay, you, you have to have a plan for the week. Uh, you've got these things you wake up with. So a day in life, you wake up, first thing you open your computer and you're going to have lots of requests, lots of messages, uh, people yeah. asking you questions. So you go through at breakfast with a coffee, Look at comments, see what's happened. Is there an issue there? You know, whatever, whatever things we have. Because now we also have an online school that we started, like a culinary school online. Wow. So that has added a lot of work yeah, <laughs> to the whole thing. And then so we've got now the, the YouTube part, and then we've got the school itself. So we've got all the students. So there's all this interaction. When you wake up, you deal with that. 
And then you organize yourself, depending on how you are. I'm not super, super organized. So, uh, you know, my, my wife helps me and now she's also working with me full time. And she takes care of all the, you know, the strategy kind of organizing and things, a bit more planning. Okay. So, okay, today we need, we need to go through uh, this, this and that, or through yeah. this week, we need to finish a few things. That's and great. it's for yourself to kind of organize uh, how you want to work. But, uh, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't say that a day in the life of a, of a YouTuber like me will be the exact same as anybody else, because I think every single person, like even you guys with, with a channel, the way you run it, the way you organize it and stuff like that, and the amount of time you dedicate to it is going to be, it's going to be fairly different. Yeah. But it will be, you know, the short answer is like, yeah, doesn't matter. As, as long as you start posting regularly, it will slowly become a daily activity. It's always in your mind. You can't get away from it. You know? I like to call this the, the hamster wheel, you know, on YouTube. Like when, <laughs> but when you, when you start... <laughs> You start a YouTube channel, doesn't matter what it is. Yeah, you, you go on and it's like, you know, you, it's, it's, not a, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. You know, you know people I totally relate to that. And we're on, on a much smaller scale with our channel. I, I relate to that hamster wheel uh, analogy that you just made, because once you're doing mm. it regularly, we post about once a week sometimes once every week and a half, but let's say roughly on average once a week. And it's that process, like you said, it's continuing yep. wheel that's constantly moving. And mm. it's, you know, it's, it's amazing and it's exciting. It's fun. It's challenging, but it's that, you know, repeating the process with the slight tweaks, improvements, always trying to grow, but yeah, that hamster wheel is just, and time just flies, flies and flies and flies. I don't know how people post more than once a week, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, that's we would need a team of people. We would need two, three <laughs> people at least. But. That, that's what I'm saying. Some people, if you have the energy, I mean, some people post, I mean, now the, the standard, like if you're not on YouTube or anyone, anyone watching and, you know, maybe curious, you know, when, because people look at my channel think, oh, you know, my God, oh, so many uh, followers, you know, whatever. Like, uh, it depends on your energy levels, what you want to do. But some people post like up to uh, three, three times a week, something like this. Yeah, and uh, and the recipe for me when you do a food channel is different than surely from what you guys do because for me I have to kind of research, but then I have to do a recipe. You know, I need to go through it. Uh, I need to make it work. Sometimes there's some testing going on. Uh, so yeah, it's a bit different. But some people do it. Like some people do like even with cooking. You know, they go two, three times a week. Like you said, it's it's crazy. Like it's it can be your it can become your life. So yeah, you you have to be careful. You know, once once you start this, it's uh, be passionate, and Take it slow. And so what would say, you know, <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the day I approach this for my life, I want to keep my, uh, you know, try to keep your sanity in there. Go at your own rhythm. Very important. You know, do what you like, share what you want to share at your own rhythm. And, you know, that's the solution, you know, to keep going and, you know, produce nice content and interesting content. Don't feel forced to, you know, do things because you have to. I mean, that's, that's really not the way to go. Yeah, no, that's definitely that's, great advice. That's a very nice thought there, like a good way to to approach it, I think. But uh, getting back uh, to you in particular, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how uh, you started your love for cooking? Because you mentioned like you worked in IT and that uh, you kind of like started like this adventure with YouTube. But what is your background in, in that sense? And so what brought you to, uh, you know, like cooking and, and wanting to make a channel and, and a culinary school? You know, the, like the, what I mentioned before, when you're, when, you're, when you're a French person, you're born with food in your DNA kind of thing. So any French person, uh, before I was cooking, I always loved to eat and enjoy food. So that's one thing. You know, when you, when you grow up, like me, like a lot of French people, you've got family kind of, you know, uh, dispersed like in various places of France. So for me, my childhood was like, you know, I had a, a somebody in Brittany. So every summer you go there and say, oh, that's seafood time. You know, you go there and what you do is uh, pick up crabs on the beach, eat mussel, cook mussels, things. You're not the one cooking, but you're just like, you know, you go with them. And, uh, and then Part I had the some, uh, you know, yeah, some, you know, some from in the French Riviera, that it would be uh, different, you know, more like food from the Mediterranean style of things. Yeah. I had a, uh, not, not an uncle in Normandy. So there's, oh, apple cider and calvados. So let's roast like a big lamb, you know. And, uh, <laughs> so you see all these things and uh, always been, you know, a good, a good eater. Well, loved eating. That was the first one. I always loved my food and stuff like this. But uh, what started all is like when I started to live abroad, because now I'm living in, in Australia. I've uh, been living in, uh, in England before. I've realized that uh, it, I was so spoiled in France to have all this food available to me, you know, like you can just walk out, buy a croissant, you got like a choice of zillions of boulangerie, patisserie, restaurants, it's like, oh, what am I eating today, you know? Uh, but here, 
uh, had that problem, there was, there was not much, you know, like the, the whole thing I was used to. And the only way to, you know, to, to fix this, I said, well, you know, I'm going to have to kind of cook things for myself. And this is where it all started. It all started as like, started to cook something. I was like, I actually don't know much about my own <laughs> You know, when French cooking is big, I was like, well, oh, yeah. you know, like uh, the, the trigger was one day. I mean, the funny story is I think one day, I think it was in England, there's uh, I was buying these, all these takeaway and I was not cooking that much of being, being lazy and uh, there's some friends and a girl came around and said, oh, you know, I love uh, crepes. You know, crepes is the basic yeah. stuff in France. Said, yeah. Oh, Stefan, you know what? I love crepes. Tell me right now, what are the ingredients to make the real French crepe? And I was like, uh, I think I need to get you, get back to you on this. <laughs> and I actually forgot. And I went the next, I was like, I, dude, I, I forgot how to make it, which is a, a sacrilege in France. If you forget how to make crepes, you, you better be dead. Really? Uh, because, you know, like, <laughs> everybody, everybody, like the one thing, everybody. <laughs> and I've realized that this is not good. I'm losing my, you know, my, you know, the French thing. I need to know how to cook French food. I'm French after all. So it, it all started. So I bought some books. Uh, I started with culinary school books, to, and I decided to teach myself uh, properly how to cook. That was how it started, like at the beginning of the channel. That was the start. So mm -hmm. I said, instead of just doing random things, I'm going to buy a book. because We got a lot of uh, culinary school books from schools in France because the scene is much bigger. The education for food in France, like you know, culinary schools, compared to here or other places, it's, it's, it's huge. You've got so many books. So I just picked one and said, well, this is from the school. And I went through the... Uh, lesson one, I remember, <laughs> and then you go page by page to learn, and uh, that's how I started my channel. I said, oh, I'm just going to go through the book, and I'm going to film this, and uh, if everybody's interested, I'm going to teach them. The first 20 lessons was extremely boring, like how to peel and wash vegetables, like for 30 videos. Yeah. <laughs> that's important. <laughs> so it today is we're important. Doing <laughs> and, then, and I think it started like this, uh, so first to find an audience. But I got more and more fascinated by, you know, uh, when I started to learn more and more and I learned about the techniques, it really kind of got, uh, you know, got me interested because it was so, you know, it's all techniques and it was, it was really wide. And the more I was looking, there was more and more things and, you know, cooks and chefs and, you know, uh, I've got, you know, Escoffier, like some, you know, master chefs or big chefs that were super well known that make all these recipes. And I just got, uh, it started from uh, fun, then it went a bit to, uh, it transformed into a hobby. Yeah. Then into more like a passion and an obsession kind of thing. You know, it, yeah. it was just more, I was kind of digging more. So, oh, there's more, there's more. And, uh, and I've been fascinated by actually to rediscover my own kind of, uh, you know, the food culture back in history as well, because it goes easily back. Now, you, you can still have two, a book that's 200 years old, like a cookbook that is still, is still valid today. So I'm using wow. books that are like sometimes 200 years old to get a recipe. Wow. And I'm like, Geez, like the, this is like reviving the dead, and uh, and I, it, awesome. just, it just grabbed me. It just grabbed me. I was just like, you know, this is fascinating. I need to share this. I need to keep going, and uh, that's why it slowly went from you know it, it took some time, but I went you know build up and build up and got more and more interested and wanted to learn more and more. When she uh, like you, when you're gonna discover more about the beer world? <laughs> oh, what about this? What about that? You know, exactly. So that's how it all came. You know, from uh, yeah. you know from necessity to start with, and then. It naturally transform into a, you know interest a hobby a passion and just like now it's becoming a career you know and that's kind of changed my life i managed to leave my day job career, which is amazing and, uh, yeah, that's a yeah do the things i guess i'm a bit lucky in a way to have found that uh, a bit fortunate but yeah that's how it started it didn't kind of instantly appear like that you know it was kind of a, a long road i have to say so what about the channel itself so that's how your love for french cooking started so chat did you mention you mentioned the washing and peeling vegetables was that the actual first video that you made for your channel back in the day when yeah, you were yeah the first the first 30 videos of the channel was just first this. 30. so yeah. <laughs> how did you what made you decide the first time to say like i'm gonna film this and i'm gonna put this on youtube and i'm gonna see what happens what was the uh, there? because there was a lot of people i think uh asking me you know in here like oh, how do you make this how do you make that and uh, when I was going online, looking at, uh, you know, some English speaking things, there was a lot of recipes saying, they, they say, oh, this is the French way of doing this. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, you know, I was like, <laughs> so that's, that's, that's not good. There's like false information on there. So I said, let me start from scratch. And I'm going to, at least I was, my idea was like, well, there must be a, a place you can go to have a reference of how to do things properly, even if it's too, 
be the vegetable stuff like that. And, and just uh, for you, the guy posting in the comments, it's like, no, it's not. It's not how it's done. <laughs> well, no, I've, I've never been a bit of a a, a troll. Like, I've never been trolling were... people. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I never, I don't comment like badly to things, but I was just to myself. I was like, oh, yeah, so, someone needs to do something about this. You know, I was like, there's a problem in the world. I was like, oh, is there someone? I was waiting for a French guy to come up and say, okay, yes, I'm starting a channel. Yeah. And uh, she said, <laughs> That was you. I, do I have to do it? I was like, no, I don't want to do it. <laughs> and I did. It was like, oh, man. <laughs> and uh, because I had this new phone. You, know, and you did it. Yeah. yeah. Did. I actually had just like, an, you know, it was an iPhone and I, I just had to change it. It was the end of my subscription. And yeah. the guy told me, oh, with this phone, you can record videos nowadays and you can post them directly on YouTube. You know, there's that little app with the iMovie and stuff. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And, uh, and I actually started to do this. I've... I've uh, you know, I touched my phone with, a, you know, the phone holder in the kitchen uh, and started filming. And it was, uh, it was just fun. I loved it at the beginning. It was, like, hey, you know, let's learn together kind of thing. Exactly. So not really. There was no plan at all. When it started, I was just going through the things and having fun. And um, the quality was terrible. When I started, like, <laughs> the lighting was awful. I didn't know nothing about video editing. I didn't know nothing about sound, about nothing at all. I was just, uh, which is good in a way. Because yeah. you don't, I think maybe new, now that you start a channel, you, you get all this pressure from all these other channels. You know, you got the, the good content, it's, it looks good, yeah. it's polished, it's researched. This, yeah, polished content, exactly. And back in the days, you know, you, I wouldn't, you, know, you would not even care about that. It's like, okay, it's just the content. What, what, am, I, what am I doing? Yeah. And, that, and that was it. It's kind of so like... Concentrate a, on that. It's a good motivation, I think, right? Because when you get to see all the other channels, when you're first starting off, and like you said, you're filming on your phone and you're just learning about audio and you're learning about editing mm -hmm. and you're seeing all these other polished channels that are putting out content and you're comparing yours to theirs and be like, okay, I need to be there. If I'm going to get this to a certain level, I need to be there. Or even just looking, even if you're not thinking, I need to be there, or I want to be there, you're seeing there are things on YouTube of that quality in the same topic or the same mm -hmm. realm. And so I need to, if I want to be taken seriously, or if I want people to click on my video, then I need to match that. So it's like this constant, it's, it's a motivation. At least that's how I look at it when editing the videos or when figuring out the audio or, or the editing process, it's like, it's a good motivation. It's a good little kick in the ass to be mm -hmm. like, well, okay, we need to, how are we going to get better? How are we going to get better? How are we going to improve this? How are we improve? Gonna... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. definitely. Uh, I guess, but you know, like I, like I was saying, I think it depends on how you are you know, with the, your approach to things. I mean, I'm seeing channels even in, 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 in other cooking stuff, like they, they're very meticulous, they're pretty particular about their videos, like they love to have uh, impeccable sounds or, or, or pictures and sometimes, uh, you know, some of the people are more like, you know, not, not too fast. Um, you know, I would say the most important, yeah, sound is have a decent sound, like you want to hear, you know, people to hear what you're saying. And yeah, decent picture as well. You don't want like some, you know, uh, and do unclutter the place. This is something I've learned early on. If you film anything, don't have like the whole mess around, you know, like sponges and things. Well, whatever you do, like, you know, the, the, even if you're doing this at home, like you're doing, you know, make a little setup, like I said, it's kind of the beer brackets poster, like the, what did you make this, by the way? Is that something you've made? <laughs> you know, what's interesting? <laughs> this is a very good question. Now, there's actually, it's a company um, on Etsy. And he's actually, they're, uh, they're going to be a sponsor of ours moving forward. But he's an amazing guy in Macedonia who makes custom woodwork sign like, signs yeah. like this. And he does an amazing job. Pretty yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, <laughs> well, happy, happy you like it. But, uh, you know, I, it's funny you mentioned about the cutting vegetables and how like, uh, you know, as a, you know, so, no, that's not how they do it in France. Like, because I've, I've had like, uh, being from Italy, a lot, a lot of similarities uh, with other things like being here in the US and I'm thinking like no that's not really how it is so I, I understand completely <laughs> yeah yeah but, uh, speaking of that I have a question that it's a it's a little particular because you know French French uh, cuisine and Italian cuisine also are normally associated with wine a lot right uh, but in your personal experience are there any dishes or <clears throat> type of experiences that in France really call for a beer because I'll give you an example. Like uh, for me, I can tell you in Italy, it's pizza. Like most people here think in the US, oh, pizza, you got to have wine with it. But really in Italy, what everybody drinks with pizza is a beer. So yeah. is there, I was curious, is there anything equivalent in France uh, in your experience? Uh, well, it's very simple because, you know, France, uh, you know, we've got a lot of borders with other countries. When it comes to beer, 
and being cooking or eating with beer, mm -hmm. uh, it's all the dishes that are near a beer country. So mm -hmm. you got Alsace, you know, and around Strasbourg. So for instance, uh, anything near Belgium, you're going to have the mussels and fries have to be eaten with beer. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So it's like, absolutely. you know, marinier mussel, you know, French fries and boom. The big would, beer, it, you can't go around this. You got the, yes. the choucroute in Alsace, which is the German style. So it is the sauerkraut with the sausages and the same thing, boom. You know, uh, the pot of beer on the side. Yes. And, and there's some region in the, in the north, really, really the north of France. Mm -hmm. They also cook with, with beer. Uh, it's called a carbonate flamande. Uh, it's, like it, it's cooked with uh, you know, dark beer and then you have to uh, drink the beer with it. So there are a few dishes, but they are all really located on the borders. On the border. Where the, 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 the culture is kind of exchanged and wh when you find uh, more beers, actually. But uh, the rest of France... There's not really, there's not really something uh, that calls for beer. Like it's every time in France when we do things, if there is a beer, it's because there's a country nearby that does beer. Because we don't do beer, <laughs> so it's like, and this is where you're gonna find. Oh yeah, don't drink wine, you know, drink beer. You know, it's like uh, that's how it works. That's it's so interesting to me how France as a country has kind of escaped uh, beer culture in that way in terms of developing their own. And I think it's it's obviously the cultures are different. But for myself, growing up in uh, Quebec in, in Canada, it's you know it's a very there's the Quebecois culture. Obviously, there's a lot yeah. of them from France, but yeah. um, you know there's a very strong mixed culture of people who have been in Quebec for multiple generations and new immigrants from France or French speaking countries. And uh, in the center of the city in Montreal, where I'm from, there are a lot of uh, Parisians, a lot of people uh, who do really enjoy their beer. But I think, like I said, they have that association with Belgian beers, and those are the ones that they know. Uh, but there is a strong Quebecois French beer culture, which is really interesting. And there's a lot of French Quebecois breweries. Uh, that have come up in oh. the last 30, 40 years um, that are really prominent now. There's one called Unibrew, actually, that we've talked about a lot in our channel that export internationally. Uh, they have one called uh, La Fin du Monde, which is one of their biggest beers that they export. Um, they have a couple. Fin, you, did you say La Fin du Monde? La Fin du Monde. The yeah. end of the world. Is that yeah. what it is? Yeah. yeah, that's the name of the beer. Yeah, it's... Uh, you, you might even be able to find it in Australia. I'm pretty sure they export it internationally. You might be able to find it down there. It normally comes in a 750 milliliter bottle with a cork and it has like a, the shape of the outline of the Quebec on the outside. But yeah, it's uh, it's interesting that I find the culture never really uh, permeated in France there too yeah. much. And you know what? I've, I've asked myself the same question with beers. I just don't know why. Like, uh, I think, you know, in France, it's like if it's... Uh, yeah, if, if, if it's not something we do well, it's not well developed or something like this, I think people are not going to bother too much to try to um, you know, open. We don't even have, maybe now there might be some microbreweries in France, but I've seen them. So uh, talking about Lyon, you know, that town, mm -hmm. uh, they are there, some people, but uh, they're usually foreigners, actually. This is what's happening in France now. You got foreigners coming sometimes, you know, from Canada or America or even some other parts of Europe or England that come and settle in France and they open a shop uh, with something different, you know, with like a microbrewery. And then the French don't know it, but we do like it. There's the thing. And when you arrive there, you're like, hey, what's that place? So you can have like this beer stuff. And uh, so I don't know. It's, I don't know if it's a laziness that's involved with a lack of knowledge in beer. That's, that's you know, that's, yeah. it's not ingrained because we do, it's too much wine everywhere. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's part of the culture, which is interesting. So it's is, hard to get the, away from the wine, you know, everywhere you go is like. <laughs> one of the things we wanted to ask you was, um, and we kind of touched on this a little bit before we started recording in our little chat before, but a lot of people believe, especially with cooking, and I think so this is probably something that you can relate to, but it's something that I think we have a shared experience because for us talking about beer, on our YouTube channel, the, the alcohol space in general, there's plenty of channels that talk about whiskey, that talk about wine. Um, in that space to be considered an expert or somebody that somebody wants to listen to that would deserve to have a million subscribers and a million views in all your videos, uh, people think that you need to be classically trained, that you need to be educated on the topic. You need to be an expert officially in one way or another to be able to be able to speak on it. What do you think about that? Because I know you just mentioned that, you know, this is a passion for you. And for us, it's the same thing. It's a passion. We're not, um, you know, it's not something we studied in school necessarily. Uh, this is something that we, it's through our own research and our own experiences that we've built up all this knowledge and this passion for it over time. And it sounds like it's the same thing for you. What, what do you think about people who think you need to be a trained expert to be able to have a voice on the matter, on YouTube specifically? I mean, you know, it's, that's very familiar to me, of course, because 
A lot of people say, oh, he's not a trained chef, because I'm a self-taught cook, you see, uh, which, which can happen. You can teach yourself. Cook. <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of people coming, oh, he's not stuff. a trained chef, so the, the, the finger is pointed a lot of time. But no, I look, uh, there's different level. Like it depends what you are actually trying to teach in bracket or present to people. Like if you, if you're trying to go straight at the expert level and you're not trained and you know, you really go like, you know, high end with all the intricacy and try to you know, dismantle everything, you may know your subject very, very well, but that's going to be harder. And I can understand people say, oh, you need to have a bit of a training when you go to that level. Mm -hmm. But there's definitely space, I think. You can be like a, a beginner or, you know, be passionate about what you're doing and, and start with the basic yourself and, and connect with people that are on the same level that don't know too much. And this is what I've been doing. Uh, most of the things I'm doing is mostly for beginners. And this is not a problem at all. Like, I don't mind when people are saying, oh, oh you're not trying. I say, well, look, I'm not trying to be the expert in that food realm. I'm not, I'm not trying to, do, to make a Michelin star dish or anything, you know. I'm just doing some simple cooking, just simple ingredients for home cooking. So it doesn't actually touch me that, that much because I know that I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, a level what I, because I would, I would think my, to myself, if I was trying to do like, oh, let me, show you, let me show you how to make an expert plating or, you know, a really intricate kind of like Michelin star stuff with all kinds of uh, yeah. things that I, I don't know. If you haven't worked in the environment, there's surely a gap there. So yeah, I would yeah. think myself, yeah, they're right to say like, yeah, maybe I would need some training on it, some, some things. But I think for me, it only happens if you're trying to, you know, to preach at a certain level. Uh, but the rest you can ignore. I don't, I don't think it's to do anything in beers that you have to be an expert who have, you know, it's just a matter of yourself. Or if you, if you love the product, you're mm -hmm. enjoying it and you want to share what you're passionate about and what your feelings are and, you know, what you feel yeah. about you, your discoveries. I mean, perfectly valid. I mean, you know, you don't need to be at all an expert. And I think it's even more interesting because you're filling a gap that perhaps, you yeah. know, that segment is not covering because a lot of people go always by default for the high end things or oh, expert. I'm an expert on this. You know, in cooking is always this. People start their video a lot of time or channels and um, even courses. You have to validate to say, oh, yes, I've been working 20 years in that restaurant and this, and I'm a trained chef. I say, well, it doesn't automatically means that you're the best at it. You know, you could have exactly. been working as a, as a commis chef for 20 years in a restaurant, you know, and still be average. You know, it doesn't, so it's, it's hard to define, you know, like the, the whole thing. thing you could work uh, in one restaurant your entire life and you can make five different dishes for 20 years. Let's say the menu never changes. And that's your experience. You say, okay, I've been a chef for 20 years, but I've been cooking the same five things the entire 20 years, as opposed to somebody who might be watching videos like yours on YouTube and every week is trying a different dish and learning and expanding their skills. And then who actually has more of a significant voice in the matter when you look at it that way, right? So it's an interesting topic. Yeah. I, and, and I think, I'm sure you're covering, uh, you know, you're covering a wide range of things. So you, like you were saying, you go in different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not about just the type of beers, you know, like how the process, I mean, there's so many things you can, you can cover. But like I said at the beginning, you know, we're talking as long as you do what you like and you really enjoy doing it, like, you know, this is just noise on the, just take it as noise on the background, people telling you, Oh no, you should not do this. I don't have the experience. You, know, you do what you do, you know, well, if you're enjoying it, why not? I mean, you know, who cares? Exactly. You're having a good time, you know, like a uh... very good time. Oh, absolutely. And especially when you get to do fun things like this and again, cheers. Well, to I that. like the beer part. It, it, it just breaks the ice a little bit. Exactly, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's a good trick. To help people always like, have oh, beer first. And, like, <laughs> and, like, oh, yeah. and then we're going to end up like dancing on the tables. Like, uh, yeah. The, but see, the interview, right? that's, that's a little bit of the beer <laughs> yeah, part, concept. Right? Like you got to have one beer to open and one beer to close. You always have to have two. Like that's. So uh, notice that the, notice oh. on the logo, the second bracket is a little crooked. That's to represent the second beer. It's not as, it's not as straight. Ah, yeah, so you're not right. as straight as when you started. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We never explained that on the channel, Alessandro. We, we did not. Time. Like, I just realized that uh, yeah, it's been there the whole oh, time. It's been a subliminal thing kind of that we never explained. But, <laughs> but speaking of that, like, um, and, and your cooking and YouTube experience, uh, do you have any very fun or special story that has happened to you, like in, uh, in this whole YouTube experience and cooking experience that you would like to share? Like, and so something that really, you know, stood out like and uh oh wow like i remember that that was uh that was something 
Uh, it was not, uh, I think the, uh, one of the moments, it was not actually, it derived from the channel. So I, when I started the channel, I was, um, it was getting some traction. Mm -hmm. There was more interest and more people watching. And it was at the time when you got these kind of uh, programs on television, you know, like MasterChef and things like that. And, uh, and then in Australia, there, there was one, uh, on national television, there was one program that goes, oh, we are starting that new series. You know, it's going to be all about uh, home cooks in their special cooking, like, you know, being French cooking, Italian cooking, and you're going to kind of uh, compete to like a restaurant uh, and you're going to make your your home cooked dish and they're going to make their version and there's going to be judges and things like this. And uh, I got an email from, you know, uh, one of the, the company television and they said, oh, you, you should uh, you should apply for that thing. Mm -hmm. When they uh, have applied and it was really early on, so I did <laughs> in my book of <laughs> learning, it was not very far. And I thought that sounds like uh, that sounds like fun and stuff. So I signed up um, and uh, and I got selected uh, out of all bizarre things and um, went to the interviews and said, "Yes, you got the gig. You know, you're going to be on the program." And uh, and I was like really mellow, comfortable. So we went there uh, for the first day of, of of shooting. So for the first episode, and everybody was stressing out. You know, and I was like, oh, "What's that?" It's fine. You know, I'm on camera all the time, so there's just a camera, no, not a problem. And uh, everybody was like, oh, you're really casual. And then uh, I remember that, that day, like we before we entered the studio, they said, okay, so it was a normal kind of staff room, you know, with just like nothing fancy at all. Yeah. And it's okay, so this is your first time on the television set. So, you know, we need to warn you, and there's going to be lots of cameramen, there's a lot of lights. Uh, it can be a bit intimidating and stuff because, you know, you get all the setup and it's all in your yeah. face if you're not used yeah. to it. You relax, we got people there. Uh, and I was like, oh. No problem. And um, so we all got in there and immediately, indeed, when we, I came out, I was like, oh, yeah, that's, that's a lot of things. And um, they started straight away to, to film. So, okay, everybody at the workstation, the judge is going to come, he's going to interview each person, ask you about yourself. And it's going to go like one, you know, one, uh, it was like a workspace, I guess, yeah. one. And yeah. that was the last one. And then they started to roll. I don't know what happened. Like, I suddenly had a kind of a panic attack. Like, <laughs> I was like, oh my God. I was like, what am I doing here? And the, the <laughs> judge was like, he just was, was filming and everything, and the camera was going close, and they were in their oh. face. And then he was coming to me, and I was like, <gasps> I was like vivid on the. Was, you could weird. see me in the background. I was like white, and I was like going, I'm gonna pass out. I was like super hot <laughs> as well. Did you pass? And out? I had to stop the production. I said, like, wait, I'm not feeling well. Like, <laughs> got like no, turn it off. Yeah, I can't do it. It's like, uh, so they, oh, yeah, stop, stop, stop. Like, they had that woman that come and talk to you. So now they have, a, you know, eat something. I have enough. Let's, let's have a chat. You know, don't worry. And, uh, and out of all things, I was like oh totally panicked. I was like yeah. the comfortable guy used to the, the video. And uh, so sometimes to just to tell you things can be, you know, depending on the environment, what you're doing, like, <laughs> it can come across yeah. like, as confident and on, and on that day uh honestly I, I know it's not channel related but that was oh man that it's, was crazy like i was i didn't know it would happen like that but you can you can have like such a blank or if you interview someone really important when you go to a location and you think it's going to be fine you know you go to um, an interview and then you lose your word you're like you're trying to ask a question like uh uh uh, uh well uh and you, <laughs> you know you're good that blank but, it does happen you know, it does happen when you do all that stuff. But did they offer you a beer before starting? Oh. I think that was the key no. mistake. <laughs> <laughs> that was. The and key. You know what? I think I think the uh, the icebreaker thing uh, idea is it's it's yeah it's it's good because it's uh, we all tend to uh, yeah we all tend to be told tense and stuff like that, which is kind of of of, of normal. Um, but if you want to know, you do it. I think the channel is nothing live, but there's a lot of bloopers, of course, that happen all the time. So when you, you know, you're trying to do your intros or when you cook something and you start something, you know, so something don't go, uh, don't go as planned and stuff like this. So it's, uh, but I never mind because I think in, in my, <laughs> there's one of the first video, I think my uh, father-in-law is always going on about it. I was doing an omelette or trying to do an omelette and uh, he was watching us. Oh, I've loved that video because you, you're talking about the omelette, how to do it. And this is how you should do it. And blah, blah, blah. You prepare the eggs and so, oh, so the omelette has to be the French omelette, like you know, no coloration, whatever. And I cook the thing and I turn it and I'm like, it's like all brown. I'm like, ah, so it failed. So it, this was not the way to do it. There's all this tutorial, but I didn't even cut anything. I didn't mind. I was like, oh, okay. So that's, that didn't work, but you know, good to know. You need to have no coloring on your omelette. You know, if you do it at home. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's but, funny. Uh, I felt, when you told that story, I I relate to you hundred percent. I think I've never gotten nervous 
in front of a camera for anything else. I mean, at filming any of these episodes, anything like that. One time I was on, have you ever heard of the show in the States, The Price is Right? It's a game show. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. It was on The Price is Right. And I remember as soon as the cameras turned on and the lights are on and everything's on you, I had a panic attack. The same thing. I went blank. And they kind of tell you beforehand what to do if you get called and they give you all the instructions. And as soon as the cameras are on you and you feel oh. the lights, I went white and I just blacked out. And I don't remember. I don't remember it. Oh, you blacked out as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't like I didn't pass out. I just I black, I went into a daze. Oh. I don't remember. And you could not speak whatever I am. And I just don't remember it. One question we wanted to ask, and this is something that we always ask people that we interview. Do a simple question. You know, some some of these questions have been a little deep up to now. Yeah. But do you have a favorite beer? Um, a favorite beer. So I'm not I'm not into strong beers. Um, I mean, if I don't have a big range of uh, of beer that I've got, but um, actually, I used to live in Holland. Mm-hmm. And one of the beers that I liked uh, was the, like I said, it's, it's called uh, Urgarden, I think. It's like the... The, the whole garden. Uh, it's like a Urgarden. white beer from yeah. Urgarden, I don't know how you call it. Yeah. That was one of one of the beers I've, I've really liked. I really don't mind the, when I went to Ireland, uh, so you got the Guinness that everybody drinks. But what is the other one, like the, the one below the Guinness, like the, the runner-up after Murphy's? Guinness? Murphy's. Murphy's or something like that. That yeah. was pretty good. As far as goes, and uh, in Australia, I mean, it's a bit of a commercial beer that I kind of already think it's it's called Stone and Wood. Okay, it's called okay. like a Pacific Ale. It's it's like a very for summer days. It's in bottles, and it's a very kind of light. It's got this kind of passion fruity. Uh, uh-huh. I like my fruits, and it's a uh, very easy drinking, but it's, it's still got character. Yeah. Uh, so for me, uh, that's a good that's a good type of beer with a bit of fruitiness into it. Mm-hmm. You know, a refreshing. And you yep. can, uh, you know, you can ha- have it like this and uh, have multiple beers. <laughs> don't, don't stop. <laughs> sessionable. It's sessionable. Sessionable. There I like go. that, but I don't, in terms of beer, I don't like when it's too hoppy. Fair too enough. Too bitter, like when it's really bitter, mm-hmm. not my favorite, I have to say. Yeah. That's it's, we, uh, we, we yeah. kind of agree on that. We, we said that multiple times on, on the channel, like we're not, uh, you know, there's a lot of hype right now with uh, hops and IPAs, uh, at least here in the, in the U S and in Canada too. But, uh, we, we are kind of like a little bit, we like more, uh, not, not too hoppy beers. So we, we understand completely. <laughs> well, uh, one question that we always like to ask to conclude our interview is, um, what do you think about the beer bracket concept? And let me explain just, uh, in case like, uh, uh it's just to make it clear. Uh, the idea is like you, uh, you know, you can, you can do it with any kind of event. You, you start with an opening beer, and then uh, you have to have a closing beer, and you always have to open and close your beer brackets. Uh, that's kind of like the the little tradition, the little rule that we have. Ceremonial. So when you say two beers, do you say two beers as two glasses of beer, or it has to be two different beers? You can have multiple beers in between. You can have as many as you want in between. It can be different ones. Like it, uh, it can also be the same one if you want to. But the 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 important thing is always having one to open. And one to close. Yeah, so yeah. It's well, you know, it's ceremonial. So it's uh, yeah, yeah. And social I think event. it's good to have uh, the fact that you have you know another bracket at the end <laughs> <laughs> to kind of conclude the session. <laughs> yeah, I like that concept. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you you, you it's keep like it, the nightcap, you know, right? Yeah, because I think a lot of time it would be a lot of times only one bracket. You know, you you start as it, it goes on and on and on off the bridge. That's that's imp- that's why it's important to have the closing bracket, like to kind of like balance it out. <laughs> I think no, I think the concept is good. Like you know, based around that, or the the length time that could be seen at the the, the length, you know, the, the time length of like you know having a beer, and then you can during that time, you know, uh, share your thoughts and and share your right. things on the subject. Exactly, and it's you know it's a bit like an uh, an hourglass, you know, when you put it on. And you know, so you get get that kind of much time. So it's 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 good to have actually a definite amount of time for things because one thing you realize you can very quickly kind of go too much. You know, you go on and on, or you do things, or you don't know what to do. So at least keeping this in these two brackets, <laughs> I <laughs> yes, think, I, I think it's exactly. I think it's a really a really good idea and um, no great concept. What was the motivation to to start? May I ask? <laughs> of course, to to, to, to so, start the beer bracket project. We um. So during the pandemic, well, we've always lived in different countries. Uh, so we met yeah. traveling in Europe. We met traveling in Ireland, actually. And uh, we met at a pub in Ireland watching a band and we had a beer together. And then we 
we were both in town for work traveling around by ourselves. So over the next couple of days, we spent some time together, traveled around together a little bit. Then after that, we kept in touch and we've always been traveling back and forth to see each other in different cities, different countries as we've been moving around and traveling together. And uh, so when the pandemic started, obviously we couldn't travel. It was pretty much almost a tradition that we had where every year one of us would fly somewhere to hang out with the other right. one. So when the pandemic started, we couldn't travel. We started to do these Zoom calls. And basically in the Zoom calls, what we would do was, because we're so passionate about beer, we'd always try and find a fun new beer to have and tell the other person about and be, hey, look at this beer that I found that's made here, you know, and like tell them about it. And we'd describe the beer to each other. And then, you know, we'd talk in between and we'd always have like two, I think that the opening and closing brackets was we'd always have like two during those calls. Yeah. So it's like all the conversation that comes in between describing the first and the second beer. And uh, we one day, I to be honest with you, Alessandro, I don't know if you remember I know we thought like maybe this could be a good either podcast or a good YouTube YouTube channel. Yeah, it's an idea. And our first video was an hour long. It's yeah. still on YouTube. You can go back and watch it. And it was just way too long. And we had no idea what we were doing. And we were just talking. There's no editing and just talking and talking and talking and talking. And then over time, we just sort of uh, refined it. Yeah, and, polished uh, it. And, yeah, and, so, and that's where you came up with the idea of the bracket. Like, maybe this was too long. Maybe we need to, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we need to have a limitation on that. That's maybe exactly it. On that. <laughs> the bracket idea actually came up way before. I think, uh, Alessandro, we came up with that, I think, in uh, when I was visiting you in Italy, right? I think so, <laughs> yeah. It was like one of the first few times that we were uh, visiting each other, like, and we were like, oh, look, like it's, we need a concept like to, you know, when, whenever you're doing something, we need kind of a ceremony, you know, like to make things uh, yeah. more official. So, yeah, uh, I think it was like, it's it, more it, like, it, the good, like it, it, it makes me think of sometimes you got like couch interview kind of thing and you, yeah. you, you got that set up. I think it's good. You, you, you put yourself in a setup where, you know, like there's a, you know, a certain amount of time and you got this environment and it is much easy to control. And so, okay, we've got, these two brackets, you know, we've got the time and okay, we've got different people coming or interviewing or whatever you do. And this is, this is going to be it, you know, so you don't have to think every single time like, oh, should we do something slightly different or should we go another way, you know. Stéphane, c'était un plaisir. Merci d'être ici avec nous aujourd'hui. Oui, yeah, pas de problème. À la vôtre. <laughs> <laughs> very very nice to meet you and talk to you today and thank you again for joining us this was a great conversation we had a great time yeah, yeah no no not a problem and always enjoy the little beers it's anytime fun. guys anytime i'm here for for, for a beer I'm, i mean I can, I can go into brackets no problem sounds good <laughs>